in the name of God, author and giver of all good things, or so the Church would have us believe. Amen. In the end, it was the collect for today, which is, by the way, proper 17 on page 233 in your prayer books, and you will want to have that reference available a little later on. In any case, it was the collect for today, not the lessons, the psalm, or the gospel, which I was moved to explore with you. But along the way, I discovered some things I hadn't previously noted about the assigned readings. And that's the reason you have that eight and a half by 11 sheet in front of you labeled sidebars. Uh, in order that I can share those things I discovered with you and yet preach on something else. Uh, in any case, who knows? You may find them more compelling than the sermon. In any case, it's pretty much an article of faith in this country that, at least for the most part, it's our own efforts which are responsible for whatever success we have experienced, and that those who work hard, playing by the rules, always have a chance to achieve something significant. So our collect's assertion that it is God, in fact, who is the author and giver of all good things, is, to put it mildly, a hard sell. Yes, we count our blessings now and then, especially regarding those things for which it's obvious we cannot claim credit. But for anyone to imply that we are mostly the undeserving beneficiaries of grace and circumstance is deeply offensive. In our hearts, if we are living comfortably and doing well, we are convinced that it is because we have, as that memorable commercial once proclaimed, done it the old-fashioned way. We've earned it. So why is the Church, in the proclamation, in its proclamation of the Christian faith, suggesting otherwise? On what basis does it claim that all the good things we enjoy are, in reality, gifts from God? and that we have played only a supporting role in attaining them. On the face of it, that's absurd. Very few have everything handed to them, and even fewer have endured no bad times and had no necessity of overcoming significant obstacles to get to where they are. Yet there is a different perspective, which, without denying the strenuous efforts we may have invested in achieving our goals, calls into serious question our contention that we are the primary, let alone the sole, authors of our own destinies. We did not, for example, as much as we might wish now and then, choose our families. And even the best of our parents had no way of deciding which of their genes we would inherit. Nor did we have a role in determining that we would be born in a country of incredible wealth and great opportunity, rather than in Somalia or Syria, or the Sudan. We did not select the century or the culture in which we would exist. 
or the people who would be in a position for good or for ill to profoundly affect our lives. Thus, to assert that we alone are responsible for all that we have is to be like the man who challenged God by claiming that he on his own could create a human being. Amused, God said, okay, show me. So the man picked up a handful of earth to begin, but God immediately protested. Wait a minute, he said, that's my dirt. And that's the way it is. Whatever we have achieved, whatever we've put together in our lives, we're working with God's dirt. Nor is that the end of the story. If our personal legacy was soil unaccountably rich in promise, we are ever called to show compassion toward those who, for no better reason, were not so lucky. From everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required, Jesus explained to his disciples. So no matter how much we have made of our gifts through our own efforts, to use our good fortune as a reason to hold others in contempt is to reject a solemn obligation inherent in those gifts. Not merely to put on an ugly display of unwarranted condescension and unconscionable ingratitude to train diligently to be a superb athlete does not entitle any of us to look down on those who must struggle mightily just to walk. Yes, there are indeed those who willfully squander what they have been given, but there are far more who work a great deal harder than any of us, often in the cruelest of situations, just to stay alive. Still, humility about our accomplishments and conscious gratitude for the undeserved endowments which are their foundation do not always come easily. Thus, later in this ancient prayer, there is a rather fuzzy petition to be nourished with goodness. Marion Hatchett, in his commentary on the American prayer book, suggests the original Latin might better be translated, nourish what is good in us. And this more pointedly identifies our need. If we're even moderately honest with ourselves, we're aware that our better selves are not always apparent in our attitudes and behavior, and that we require help if what is good in us is to become more evident help perhaps even to want what is good in us to become more evident. And we sometimes need help as well just to hold on to the goodness we have displayed in the past. Often my prayer for those deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan is simply that they may not lose their basic humanity as they struggle to survive the horrors of war. Make no mistake, that can indeed happen to us. And thus the original conclusion of this collect had nothing to do with asking God